Greetings again in Jesus' name. As our recent videos have caused much controversy and concern among certain people, just trying to put the scriptures out there. You know, I've never said that anybody's got to believe my creed or my doctrine. I'm just trying to show you what the Bible teaches so that you can go and search the scriptures yourself and find what the truth is. If you're still confused then, I would ask you to discern between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What I want to look at here is an idea about the repeat after me way of salvation that we see in almost all the churches. Either receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or repeat some words, or the old Billy Graham thing that uh, really wasn't originated with him. Uh, there was people in the past, like Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody, that used much the same methods. He just uh, copied those methods in the 1950s when he was a young evangelist, and it worked because it appealed to people's minds that they could inherit eternal life and go on about their lives and sin and not worry about it because Jesus no longer seen them sinning like he used to say. He says, Jesus doesn't see old wicked heart of Billy Graham. He just sees Jesus. You know, you've, you've seen those videos before. A lot of people have exposed the man. I'm not out here to uh, repeat, uh, repeat their work. What I'm doing here is I think this describes more than anything else the present day so-called church, the apostate church, is this repeat after me. Because they won't test the spirits. Like 1 John 4, verse 1, he said, Do not believe. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God. See, today, most of the professing Christians are like parrots. They've been taught by rote what to believe. Like infants that learn to uh, call their parents mommy and daddy. They call Lord, Lord, like the scripture says. And they have a canned sinner's prayer with nothing about departing from iniquity, but they think that they're doing good works in his name and all that kind of thing. So they, it's the parrot that they just keep repeating the same things over. Like, you don't sin? Uh, uh, if, if you could say sin, stop sinning, you could save yourself, and nobody can stop. Everybody was born in sin. All those things are parroted out of their mouths with absolutely no support for them in the Scriptures. The preachers do this, too. They just repeat after their favorite pundits, who them, themselves, the pundits, repeat more pundits higher up the food chain, so to speak. And together, then, they manufacture this massive system of error that cre creates what I call, then, the spirit of the age in which we live. The spirit of the age. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he calls it the God of this age. Verses 3 and 4 he says, for even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. See, the God of this age is in this idea of everything is repeat after me. Everything's parroted from the pulpits. It's just a canned delivery, so to speak, like the salesman that comes to your door to sell you something. He has a canned delivery, the car salesman, the, the, the guy that's selling you aluminum siding, whatever it is. He has a canned approach. Jehovah Witnesses are like that when they come to your door. They have a canned approach. You get them off that canned approach, they get all frustrated, and they usually d depart very quickly because they don't want to discuss anything the Bible really says. So no doubt then that most of the present-day Bible pundits are blinded by the God of this age to the fundamental truths of repentance and faith proven by deeds, which needs most desperately to be disseminated to this generation. But they are receiving a light from some source. Remember, Jesus said, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So they're perceiving something entering into their mind that resembles light, some alternative source of light. Now, that's a frightening concept that you're receiving something that resembles light in every aspect, but in reality, called by Jesus himself a great darkness because the eyes full of sin and lust that you won't cast from you. This generation surely cannot perceive, just like uh, Matthew 13, where he talks about the people that can hear, they, they see 
but they do not perceive what their eyes behold. In that very first verse of that, they hear and they, they, they can't, they can't discern. But see, they're seeing, but they can't perceive what they're seeing because the spirit of the age. See, the spirit of the age is expressed, I believe, in a melding pot of false doctrines that originated from the father of lies. As Jesus called him in uh, John 8, 44, when he was uh, debating with the Pharisees, you are of your father, the, he's, he's the originator of lies. The beginning of all time. When Lucifer, as, as, the, as the scripture calls, the angel of light, which Lucifer translates in Isaiah 14, 12 as the light bearer, the son of the morning, the bringer of dawn, the shining one, different translations of that word. See, he told man right at the beginning, or woman, so to speak, that you could disobey God, sin, and you shall surely not die. In Genesis chapter 4, or chapter 3, I'm sorry. That's the foundation of every fallacy and false assumption and system of doctrine that's ever been invented from that time forward. And what the prophets have been railing against from that time forward. Disseminated into creeds and opinions and books and that could fill a billion pages of text, maybe more. But it's summarized, as we put it, man's born in sin, saved in sin, and can never stop sinning. That's how they summarize it. A deadly combination. The spirit of this age, the God of this age, parroting these false doctrines over and over and over. Kind of like the propaganda of the of Germany that is learned by all our present governments, you keep repeating a lie long enough, and the people believe it. Well, it's the same. It's the same in the, the church. So here's the source then that resembles light in the minds of people. See, it passes itself off as great wisdom with great swelling words of emptiness, a promise of life while the corruption remains. They promise them liberty while their while their sins remain. Smooth words and flattering speech designed to deceive the simple-minded people that won't look this stuff up. See, it comes from a, the form of a harmless lamb. You know, dispensing words of righteousness with a form of godliness that appears to be genuine. It has a friendly smile and a warm handshake, a magnetic sense of appeal. Many of these guys have magnetic personalities, like Joel Olstein. Look at that, this is one of the biggest wolves out there. People are drawn to that wealth and success and prosperity. See, people, they're drawn to this stuff like a dog to its vomit. And I put it that way because that's exactly what's being dispensed, is vomit. See, they love the pleasant voices and the finely tuned instruments that create a soothing assurance of confidence that they're hearing the truth and everything's going to be fine with God. See, together, this all works, this mesmerizing effects on the minds of man that takes them captive. And they think they're receiving the light. All the churches are all around. See, I drive around all these churches in my daily life, and I see on their little signs out front in their yard that they got some little trite saying about Jesus, about how much he loves you, and what, you know, and, and Jesus assures you everything's fine and dandy. It, again, they're just parroting each other to draw people in to this false sense of security. See, light can have two effects. It occurred to me. See, light can reveal out of darkness, yes, but it can also blind people, a blinding light. See, many professing Christians under this saved and sin lie, they testify to receiving like overwhelming flashes of light, uh, seeing angels of light having visitations. They speak of a warm, glowing feeling of euphoria and even doves descending down from above in their services. Some people testify of visions about moving down this long corridor towards some blinding light, overcome with a profound sense of awe. We see that a lot in near-death experiences. See, many people lose control of their emotions and they babble incoherently and they thrash around and gravitate their bodies in strained contortions and then they lose total control and go limp as though they're slain in the spirit. We see this kind of stuff in the Pentecostal range. But a great number of people just equate this pseudo-light with human wisdom. If somebody has great rhetoric, great oratory, an eloquent speech, 
It exalts itself then over the simplicity that's in Christ, like 2 Corinthians 11 talks about in, in, in verses 2 and 3 about Eve being seduced from the simplicity that's in Christ. Like many of you are by these smooth-talking pundits that seem to be so good. They're wolves in sheep's clothing, yes. They're harmless as lambs, but they're dispensing a deadly message that's going to destroy your soul. See, to unravel this spirit of error that's ensnaring your mind, you got to try to think of seducing spirits. See, think the, the spirits that are behind this. We'll get into this. Try to think of them as masters of FX. FX is Hollywood special effects. Now, we know, especially today in the day of computer-generated images and all that stuff, that they're capable of producing images that are fantastic. It could fool almost anyone. They can holograms and project images and all kinds of things. But imagine then what we're up against in this warfare between the spirits and their ability to do these things to the weak human mind. See, the lying signs and wonders that are giving this to the susceptible human minds give them a glimpse of the powers beyond their reach, kind of like a peek behind the curtain in the veil of secrecy. See, humans can't hold a candle against this kind of wrestling match, as it's called in the scriptures. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. See, they're at work in the celestial realm, and they dominate the spirit of this age. And they can sway the thoughts of man and influence his passion for wealth and success and pleasure. It's like John said in his First John 5. He holds the whole world under his sway, meaning under his influence, meaning the, the, Satan and his demons. So it's the spirit of this age that makes light into darkness, but it appears as light. Why? Well, because they can appear as angels of light. They can appear as ministers of righteousness. See, so the weapons of our warfare in this battle cannot be waged from an earthly sensation or a double-minded man that's still partly spiritual, partly carnal. See, there's no such thing. See, a spiritual war, war must be engaged in a spiritual mind. Like he talks about in 2 Corinthians 10, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual for pulling down of strongholds. He says, and in fact it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and casting down arguments in every high thing See, every wisdom of man, anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into the captivity and obedience of Christ and being ready to correct all disobedience or punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. See, when you're in the Spirit, spiritual man judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no man. Why? Because he's in the mind of God. He's a partaker of the divine nature. That's why. Not a finger pointer, not, a, not false accusations, not hypocritical judgment. No, he's judging between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error that's taking these people captive and leading their souls down the road to destruction. See, repeating the rhetoric of these preachers and pundits is not going to combat the seducing spirits. You can repeat this stuff all day long. Uh, you're saved in your sin. If anybody could stop sinning, they wouldn't need Jesus. And you're born in sin and you're depraved. You, you can repeat all the. It's not going... That, see, that in-house debating over those things only encourages these spirits to work even more diligently to delude your minds. And that's what's happening here. That's why we're not engaged in an in-house debate here. See, what will discourage these spirits the most? And what we know for sure is fervent preaching of repentance and faith proven by deeds, resulting in people that are actually coming out of their sins into the real light of God, like Acts 26, 18 through 20. Bringing them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. That's what's going to disturb them the most, and that's what frightens them out of their wits, and they put their full force of energy against that, to oppose it with all the deceptions that they can in the minds of people. And they use the glittering lights, and they use the, the magic and the FX and all that stuff that draws the people, the big music and the bands and the euphoria. And that's how they draw these people in. They hold them in captivity so people don't have a clue what's really going on in the spiritual world right around them because they're having fun. But the spirits have got them 
gripped in darkness. To them, people, they think, well, it's the age of grace. They have a free ride to heaven. Enjoy the music. And we're a bunch of maniacs out here trying to tell them they got to live right and stop sinning. See, it requires a spiritual mind to understand spiritual things. We alluded to this in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14 and 15. See, the natural man, the carnal mind, has absolutely no sense of discernment into these type of matters. None whatsoever. See, the warfare that's spoken of in Scripture is waged against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and the spiritual hosts of wickedness of this age, according to Ephesians 6.11, where it talks about the armor of God. See, these spirits are mentioned again by Jude in verse 6, where he talked about that they did not keep their first domain, but left it to establish their own dominion. See, there was dominion, all dominions under God, but this is where they broke away from God to establish their own dominion. There we have the conflict that is now engaged over the control of the mind of man. The strongholds, let's talk about in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, it's a metaphor of a Roman fortress, of course, but rep what it represents is a stronghold of lies and deceptions and arguments Great swelling words that exalts itself against the knowledge, the noscus of the truth, meaning the advanced and deep understanding of God. Casting them down is rightly and soundly dividing the word of God to reprove and correct the dissenters and expose them as fools. That's what it's for. Like Second Timothy 2.15 says, in, uh, I mean, First Timothy 2.15 and Second Timothy 3.16, where he instructs him to do that. You know, correct them, reprove them. All these dissenters with the word of God, not with the carnal weapons of man. See, punishing all disobedience is refu referring to people that refuse to obey the word of God. See, they resist the Holy Spirit in favor of the seducing spirits, like the Jews were doing when Stephen pre preaching to them in Acts 7, uh, 51 through 53, when he says, you hard-headed and stiff-necked people always resist the Holy Spirit. See, these people impugn the righteous and cast aspersions on the truth. Of course, then they killed the righteous. That's why everything in the religious establishment is in reverse, as we've shown so many times before. Good is evil, evil is good, man is born in sin and saved in sin. Instead of escaping the corruption in the world through lust, as the scripture says, he's ensnared by it in permanent bondage to his carnal desires, with no desire to even change. The spirits that masquerade then as the angels of light, ministers of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15, see, they rob the people of discernment while they inflame their passions for the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's what they do. See, they become people become enemies of God then, in their love for the world, like John says in that passage, First, first John 2, love not the world, but the things in the world. Anyone who loves the world makes himself an enemy of God. See, because their vain amusements and vile habits, they become, set themselves up as enemies of God. It's like James talks about in James chapter 4. You adulterers and adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God, meaning you're against God? But see, to them, the friendship of the world, they think they have God's approval in that. Because, again, the spirit of this age, the parrots, keep repeating the same things over and over in their minds like a recording. It just keeps rolling. That Everything's fine. That's why we get the same responses again and again and again on the blogs to everything we say about substitution and this putted righteousness and sins forgiven in advance and all that nonsense. They just repeat the same things they keep hearing. Same things. That's, that's all they know. See, the spirit of the spirit that's at work in the world mani is manifested in man's cravings for more and more. Like James 4 begins there. He says he does not have, so he covets, and he cannot obtain, and he wars, and he it, it, that's where he says we're wars. What he's talking about is conflicts. To, to grab after more. See, the self-seeking and envy brings on further confusion in every evil thing, like he, he talks, James says in chapter 3, 
when he talks about the wisdom from above and the wisdom from the uh, below, the devil. So he runs to and fro then, looking for every pundit out there that will parrot something that he desires to hear that give him another excuse to live in sin. So the voices then cry from every every angle in this, this world. Come and see us. We have the Spirit. We have the manifestation. Come and be touched by God. The anointing is here. You'll feel the love. The music is wonderful. See, in all the noise and the glamour, clamor, it's difficult to resist the presentation. It's so highly polished and glittering and deeply moving to the soul, just like music can be very influential. See, the masses are caught up in this, in a euphoric enchantment of the moment, and they get an assurance. I've had people tell me, well, I get a warm feeling when I leave my church. I, I have this warmth over me. See, that glow is coming from these seducing spirits. They've got your mind cap captive to the lie. You don't even see any problem with it. See, they tug your heartstrings, and they convince you that, well, you're approved of God. Everything's fine. See, but God's not the author of confusion. He's not going to be conjured up in emotional displays and people thrashing around and babbling and doing all this nonsense. No, he's a God of order. See, people look for signs and wonders and feelings and all this euphoria. They seldom submit to sound doctrine. In fact, I've never found one that will submit to the sound teaching of Scripture. Not once they've experienced what these false spirits can do. Once they've experienced that FX, it looks like they're done for. See, the flavor of the religion that you prefer most is going to be your preference despite, despite what is taught out of the Bible. See, the, par the parrots that are in the pulpit are going to give you what you want. You're going to find it somewhere. So you're going to remain under the dominion of sin as slaves to whom you obey, as the Scripture so clearly teaches. You're a slave to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But no, that doesn't doesn't compute with, with the people there. See, for they, they don't know how to make war against the host of wickedness that's manipulating their minds, so they stand spiritually naked in an all-out battle for the possession of their eternal souls. See, they, they don't know what to do because they're totally pleased in taking pleasure under the delusion they're in. See, it talks about in, in Ephesians the whole armor of God. You, you probably read this in your Sunday school class and don't give it a second thought. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and shod your feet in the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication. It means constant, constant prayers and, and pleadings. In the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Now, Paul was likening this to the Roman armor. See, he was talking about the, the sword and the, and the girding of, girding of the truth and the, the armor that the soldiers would wear going into battle. But what I like in this too is preparing the saint being prepared to go to battle and do battle with the spirit of darkness of this age. See, Satan is looking to devour, like Peter says. He's, he says, he says in, in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5, that Satan's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He says, uh, Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in all the world. See, they understood what they were up against. See, today, Satan, he's defeated. It's a done deal. It's all in advance. Uh, it, it, it's the substitution. He took the penalty, the price. Now you got to free ride. See, that's the false doctrine with the spirit of this age is preaching through the many pundits that keep parroting the same thing. So I look at this then as to be girded in truth is to love the truth. See, that's the problem with people under strong delusion. They love not the truth that they might be saved. They despise it. They argue against it. They cast aspersions on it. It doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean that. 
like we, what we've seen them do. See, so this disqualifies then the double-minded parrots who only love to repeat what they've heard from the other parrots. They don't love the truth. They love what's being repeated. They love what's learned by rote. To put on the breastplate of righteousness, I think it's saying to have your heart purified by a faith working by love, by obedience to the truth. That's the breastplate of righteousness. Since the parrot gospel is not of works and nobody can be pure and everybody's filthy in their sin, well, that's impossible to have a breastplate of righteousness because you're unrighteous. You're filthy rags righteousness. You're the chief of sinners. So there is no righteousness. There's no doing what's right. Doing what's right is self-righteousness, they keep telling me. To have your feet shot in the preparation of the gospel of peace is to be rooted and grounded and unmovable in the truth. See, the Romans wore a boot that had a shot on the end, kind of like a cleat that stuck into the ground so they could weld their sword with more balance. The same thing here, to be grounded and unmovable in the truth. Like the scriptures tell you that you have to be, or you're going to be devoured, you're going to be destroyed. And most of you have never been in the faith to begin with, and that's under this lie, this repeat after me lie. So the only thing that the feet of the professing Christians want to do is they're quick to walk into sin. Like swift to shed blood, as the Proverbs like to say, but these people are swift to sin. Not shot in the preparation of the gospel of peace. To them, the gospel of peace is the age of grace, and you don't have to do anything. The shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, I think, is a deep and earnest con conviction to contend for the truth at all costs fa and facing all odds. See, the shield having a, a leather, leather covering could quench fiery arrows, the ancient shield. Our shield is that truth to contend earnestly against all these lies, to pull down those strongholds, to bring every thought into the captivity of Christ, to never give up, no matter how disheartening or how discouraged that these people want to tr try to make you. The only thing that the repeat after me crowd can do is contend why they can sin and not die. The helmet of salvation and the sword of truth of the Spirit, of course, is the Word of God. This is the bread of life to a true disciple of Christ. The word is living and powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, as Hebrews 4.12 says. Before a person can wear this helmet and wield this sword in battle against these spirits, they have to be saved to begin with through repentance and faith proven by deeds. A faith working by love that purifies their heart and has victory over sin, the flesh, and the devil. That disqualifies the church people, the repeat-after-me people, because they love not the truth, and they remain under this strong delusion. See, the prayer and the supplication and the perseverance, is perseverance and patience and long-suffering is pretty much all the same thing in the Scriptures. See, this is the pattern of life for a saint. Asking and seeking and knocking, persistent purpose, remaining steadfast to the end. Spoken of in Romans 2.7 is patient continuance in doing good. Endurance in James 5.11. And patience and faith of the saints in Revelation 13.10. That's just a few places. Just a few. That's what it is. That's what perseverance and steadfastness is all about. Not just patiently waiting for the next spaghetti supper or the next pageant that the church is going to throw or the, the trip that they're going to take. No. No, that's fantasy land. That's fantasy land where the Lord's going to preserve you and he overcame in your place in prayer and supplication. It's just asking for more stuff, more goodies from God. It's that slot machine in the sky, so to speak. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He, he says in Ephesians 6.11. And then in verse 13, he says, then having done all, having done all then to stand, to stand in that truth. If you've done everything you can do, then you stand. And if you die, you die. That's what they did the early saints. I'm going to do a video on the gospel of Christ and contrasting this modern fairy tale gospel that's preached in worldwide today 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ that brought millions to salvation in the early times. So to achieve, to achieve a final and complete victory over the spirit of the age and the spirit of error, you got to possess a faith that overcomes sin, the flesh, and the devil by purifying your mind and heart from all the smut and the pollution and the filth and the seducing spirits, everything that they have to offer in this glittering world of religion and entertainments and sports and politics and multitudes of vain amusements out there and your little handheld devices that you constantly play with. These things are nothing more than the repeat-after-me propaganda that's designed, kind of like Madison Avenue, designed to impersonate the truth and influence people to invitate the mainstream, to mimic it, mimicking spirits, the spirits of this age. That's what you're following. This present age that we live in can either be your, your demise or it can be your present truth, as Peter called it. The final choice is yours to make. You can follow the parrots and repeat after them, or you can make your stand in Christ. Get yourself repented and purified in that faith and stand. It says in Titus 2, 11 and 12, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us to denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, not in the age to come, not suddenly you're going to be made perfect in this so-called rapture nonsense. No, in the present age to fight this battle that's being waged in our world today. Look at the ravages of it. Look at the ruin and the destruction of the lives of the people that are being destroyed and ravaged by sin. And you defend sin and you stand under in the pulpits and talk about how you can sin and not die and how you sit under that message and think it doesn't affect you. Wake up. Wake up before you lose everything. Things are going to get tough, real tough in this country quickly. It can't go on like it is. There's no way on possible earth that it can. The destruction of our culture and our freedom and everything that we thought we were grew up in. I'm 63 years old, going on 64. What I grew up in from the 1950s is gone with the wind, folks. If you can't hold on and cling to Christ and stand with that full armor of God, you're going to be swept away in the whirlwind that's coming. So I beseech you, those of you out there, caught in this repeat-after-me nonsense, to repent. Come to Jesus. Come to the website at standingthegap.org. Look at our PDF files under our books link. All the notes, all the information, I try to keep it up to date and keep the stuff posted up there so you can get your questions answered. Email me at Holding Firmly if you have any further concerns. I'm always available there to answer your questions. Those of you out there that are standing fast for the Lord and contending for the truth, Stand fast in your faith. Be grounded in steadfast. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged no matter what comes your way. We've been at this for a long, long time. And we've been through many, many discouragements and many, many false brethren and all the perils that come, that are coming through those things. Don't let it discourage you. Stand fast.